This is a strange way to do a tour of this building in these odd times where touching objects and entering buildings and sharing spaces have become our enemies and something to be defeated in 2020. And every time I enter this building, 6 Harcourt Street, a place I've been privileged to work in, in my role as one of the headquarters staff at Conor na Gaelge, the organisation founded in 1893 by Douglas Hyde and Owen MacNeill to save the Irish language, I walk up these stairs, this beautiful staircase built at the end of the 18th century, a masterpiece of carpentry, and I touch this handrail, this original handrail, a handrail used by generations who have walked through the halls of this house, generations, people who have moulded the history of our nation for good and for bad and for better and for worse, but hopefully mostly for the better. And I hope also that in our current day, in our work in Conor na Gaelia, that we're moulding the future of our nation for the better. But in any case, this house, like many Georgian houses, was built in Dublin towards the end of the 18th century. Harcourt Street, which extends southwards from St Stephen's Green, began to be laid out in the 1780s, and plots of land were leased to people who were interested in living in the area. Amongst them was a man called Hans Blackwood. He was the son of a minor nobleman from County Down. And he had moved to Dublin, being the fourth son, probably imagined he wouldn't really ever have any chance of inheriting his father's title. He made a livelihood for himself in business with his brother Price, the fifth son. Uh, and Hans married a lady called Mehetable Temple, who had been born in Boston. She and her two sisters had fled from Ten Hills during the American War of Independence. They were loyalists and they didn't believe they would be happy in the new Republican United States. Uh, so they made their way back to Ireland, which at that stage was still part of the British Empire. And they thought that they would be able to live out their lives in the way they wanted to live them there. Temple and Hans Blackwood had several children. Um, the eldest of them, Price went on to become a captain in the Royal Navy, uh, died in 1841, and his son, Frederick Temple Blackwood, became the Lord Lieutenant of Canada and later Viceroy of India and went on to become the first Marquess of Dufern and Clandeboy. That house still stands today. So they were very much a family on their way up in the world, minor nobility, but people who definitely had an idea of social progression and where they wanted to go in society very much a part of the institutions of the British Empire very invested in the growth of the British Empire and indeed Hans actually was a member of Parliament of the Irish House of Commons under the British system before the Act of Union uh, just before the famous vote on the Act of Union to join Ireland formally to the United Kingdom a vote that famously was won through threats and, and bribery Hans actually sat in the Irish Parliament. So the house, the house's first connection with parliamentary history is with the end of the Irish Parliament, which was on College Green. So in a strange way, the house's first connection with parliamentary history in Ireland is a negative one. It is with the end of the original Irish Parliament. The Blackwoods sold the house in 1819 to a lady called Anne Seagrave. She was a Catholic widow. We're not too sure where her means came from. We don't know who her husband was. She had several sons. One became a Jesuit missionary. Another was a barrister. And Seagrave was very active in the 1820s, supporting Catholic emancipation. Her name frequently appears in newspapers as a donor to various causes. Big supporter of Daniel O'Connell's. And as the Catholic middle class starts to come to the fore in Dublin in the 1830s and 1840s, in the aftermath of Catholic emancipation, Seagrave's name is, is there. It's always there in the background. So it's no surprise to find that she continues her support for Catholic causes by making Number 6 Harcourt Street available for John Henry Newman, uh, an English convert to Catholicism who had come to Dublin in the 1850s to found the Catholic University as a competitor, as, an, as a rival to Trinity College. And he moved in in November 1854, settled himself in the rear room at the top of the house probably so he'd have a bit of peace and quiet there from the students. 16 students of various nationalities lived in the house as they went about their studies and got to know the city of Dublin. 
one of the students actually slept in the room that I work in most of the time when there isn't a pandemic going on, William O'Shea. William O'Shea, of course, became notorious later on. He was the husband of Catherine O'Shea, uh, who was the initiator of the Parnell scandal. Well, in fact, William was the initiator of it because he sued her for divorce. And he had a very bad reputation in Irish history. He's been quite a, quite a nasty character. It's interesting that Newman actually threw him out of the university after only six months. He recognised his character very early on. Newman's university was a very interesting model. Uh, and he stayed in Dublin, and while he was in Dublin, he lived in that house most of the time. Newman lived in Six Harcourt Street from 1854 until 1858, when he left Dublin. And the university also stopped using the house very shortly afterwards. It was then sold to Richard Barker de Burg, who set up a military school. It was a kind of a preparatory school, a private college for Dublin teenagers who were interested in becoming officers in the British military. It operated in the house for a number of years uh, in the 1860s, early 1860s. Edward Carson was one of the most important leaders in unionism in Ireland in the late 19th and early 20th century, instrumental in the creation of Northern Ireland. It's very interesting to note that when he was born in Harcourt Street in Dublin in 1854 at number four, number six was basically being run as first a university and then later on as a military school and the street had an extremely imperial and very loyal character. That of course was to change later on. Throughout the 1870s and 1880s the house was in the hands of a doctor and then a businessman Richard Ross and Greening who uh, wasn't a particularly successful businessman. We've discovered in the course of our research on Six Harcourt Street that he actually took out five mortgages at various points on the house. And sure enough, he slipped into debt and it became irredeemable. And thus, Six Harcourt Street went on the market in 1908. It took two years to find a buyer. The buyer in the summer of 1910 was the Sinn Féin Cooperative People's Bank uh, under the direction of Tom Kelly, Alderman Tom Kelly. The bank had been set up by Arthur Griffith. It was one of these small cooperative enterprises. The Sinn Féin party at the time had a lot of interesting and different beliefs. It was not a Republican party. It believed in the dual monarchy. It also believed in self-sufficiency for the Irish economy. And one of their projects was to set up a cooperative bank on the German model. This had been set up on the north side of Dublin City, but it was expanding and it was felt that both the bank and the party needed new premises. So the deal was the bank would buy the building and then the party would lease rooms from the bank. And so the Sinn Féin party moved into Six Harcourt Street in 1910 on the 21st of June, Wolf Tone's birthday. They had a huge party, which is described in the newspapers. It's very interesting. And Countess Markovich gave a speech in which she referred to the school, military school, a British military school, which had been in the house in the 1860s, talking about how they would eventually themselves, the Sinn Féiners, be training a different army for a different purpose. Ominous words indeed. Very rapidly, the house became a centre of political discussion and social activity in Dublin. Anya Kant says in her witness statement to the Bureau of Military History that she first saw Porrick MacPeerish, Patrick Pierce attending a political meeting outside the auspices of Conor Nogelia at 6 Harcourt Street in 1911. And a lot of planning for the Easter Rising by people who were involved in, in, in the Rising was done at 6 Harcourt Street, although it was not the most central location for that. There was some action in and around the house during the Rising. Of course, Stevens Green was the centre of the activity of the Irish Citizen Army. Harcourt Street was one of the approach roads from Portobello Barracks, as it was in Rathmines, a British Army base, to the city centre. And the British Army occupied a lot of buildings on the street on the approach to the College of Sur Surgeons, on, on the approach to the College of Surgeons in Stevens Green, taking up positions on rooftops and taking over buildings. And Harcourt Street, 6 Harcourt Street, was also taken over. And it was from there that Margaret Skinner, the only woman who was injured in combat during the Easter Rising in 1916, was shot. After the Rising, of course, the Irish volunteers were interned in very large numbers. They were taken in many cases to camps in Wales, Frangach being the most famous one. Some were taken to prisons in England. And the Sinn Féin party was very much 
blamed by the British for the rising having taken place, although, of course, the party itself had not played a role in initiating or organising the rising. Of course, many members of the party were involved, but the party itself as an organisation was not uh, responsible for the rising. They profited, however, from the fact that the British authorities were blaming them. And as people began to drift back to Ireland from the internment camps in late 1916 and early 1917, they gravitated towards the party and they began to use the party as an adjunct to the volunteer movement. It was very strongly felt that a dual strategy was necessary. And those first moves came towards the end of 1916 when Amman had a meeting at Six Harcourt Street and elected Countess Markovic as their president. In early 1917, the Sinn Féin organisation began to be reactivated. They began to recruit staff and raise money again. Um, and throughout that year, the strategy of planning for a general election, a United Kingdom general election, and using that as a mandate for Irish independence very, came very strongly to the fore. We see really interesting accounts in the records of higher gas bills and uh, the Sinn Féin Cooperative People's Bank complaining about people staying late in the office, working hard, striving to make this election campaign a success. Throughout 1917, the policy takes shape. The party's programme becomes explicitly Republican. They are no longer aiming at a dual monarchy, but at nothing less than full independence for Ireland. Robert Brennan is recruited. and He becomes a, the director of elections for the party. He orders strategies and tactics and distributes those orders throughout the country from Six Harcourt Street. And by the time an election is announced as the First World War is coming to a close, they are ready at Six Harcourt Street. They are ready to fight an election and they are ready to win an election. It's going to be an unusual election just in the aftermath of the First World War, also with the pandemic. Uh, the great Spanish flu of 1918 is in full flow in Ireland at that time. The electorate is going to be much bigger than it has ever been before. All adult males over 21 will be allowed to vote and all women over 30 will be allowed to vote in this election, a much larger electorate than before. And of course, all of the things that have happened since the rising will be big factors in this election. The Sinn Féin party is running on a platform of abstaining from Westminster, as it's called. That means that they will stand in the election, they will accept the election if they win, but they will not go to Westminster to sit in the British Parliament in London. They will take the mandate to create a parliament of their own meeting in Dublin and making an attempt to run Ireland as an independent state. And this parliament will become known as Doyle Ayrn. The election is announced in November. Loyalist mobs and groups of drunken Trinity students attack the building. There's a furious fight in the hallway. Harry Boland is involved, but the building is defended and they manage to prevent the election headquarters from being burnt down. The election takes place on the 14th of December. It takes two weeks for the election results to come in because many British soldiers who are stationed overseas just after the First World War are of course entitled to vote. Their votes have to be carried home to be counted in the, in the home constituencies. So a lot of the results are unclear until the 28th of December. However, the Sinn Féin party is very sure of victory and at a meeting of their Ord Corlea held at 6 Harcourt Street on the 19th of December, the decision is made to establish Doyle Ayrn in the new year as soon as opportunity will allow. They get to work on the logistics of setting up the new parliament. Harry Boland and Sean T. O'Calley are very important in the office at this time, sending out messages to the newly elected Chachti Dáil, messengers to the Dáil, the Irish term for a member of parliament or representative. They organise meetings in number six to draft declarations of independence and to draft various other documents that will be needed for the first public sitting. They book rooms, they deal with raids from the British authorities who are determined to suppress this movement. On the 21st of January 1919, the Doyle sits for the first time in the Mansion House and the work done at Six Harcourt Street plays a massive role in that. Really, Six Harcourt Street is where the idea of using the election to create Doyle Aaron is conceived and the work to make that happen is carried out and then Finally, after the election, the decision is made to establish Dáil Éireann. So this house is the home of the Irish Parliament in many, many ways. 
Six Harker Street's role in the War of Independence is not finished at this point. Throughout 1919, really until September, it's one of the main buildings of the new independent Irish state. In April 1919, Michael Collins is appointed Minister for Finance. His job is to raise a huge amount of money to help the independence movement and to help the Doyle run the country. And he works from a back office on the second floor of Six Harker Street. The second floor of Six Harker Street really is the nerve centre of political activity in the independence movement in Ireland throughout 1918 and 1919. De Valera's office is there, the Doyle Publicity Department is there, or our Propaganda Department is there, and Michael Collins' office as Minister for Finance is the rear room. He does a lot of work here, drafting documents and organising the logistics of a money-raising campaign, issuing cheques from here, many of which survive to this day in the archives. His time in Number 6 Harker Street comes to an end on the 12th of September 1919, where there's a massive raid where he's almost captured. A police officer, Inspector Neil McFeely, actually walks into the office where Collins is working on papers connected with the Doyle loan and gets into a conversation with him. To this day, we don't know if McFeely recognised Collins, but whatever the truth of the matter, he seems quite intimidated and leaves the room. Collins takes that opportunity to slip up this narrow staircase up to the original servants' quarters of the house and then uses these steps to climb out onto the roof through this skylight and wait until the raid is over. He returns, of course, when the soldiers and the police have gone, and he continues his work until the end of the day. But after that, really, Collins goes on the run and lives underground in Dublin until the end of the War of Independence. In early 1920, the British ordered the shutting down of the building, the closing of the building, seal it up, they nailed the doors shut. Some staff continue to work here, but they tend to be relatively junior staff. Senior members of Sinn Féin and the independence movement know that the address has now become too dangerous. Uh, The house is hotly contested during the Civil War period. Both sides of the argument claim to be the inheritors of the true legacy of the Sinn Féin party. And uh, they try to get control of the house. It's kind of a a microcosm of the battle for control of the country. Um, Because of the trouble of the Civil War and the fortunes of the Sinn Féin party at that time, the Sinn Féin Cooperative People's Bank, which is the owner of the house, goes bankrupt. And the Free State forces the sale of the house in order to cover the debts. The house is bought by the Office of Public Works on behalf of the Irish state, as it's called in Irish, and it takes on various governmental functions over the following years. Here in 1926, the Gaeltacht Commission meets uh, in Dublin to decide what the state's policy towards the Gaeltacht should be and how the Irish language should be promoted in those areas. Uh, It sits for several months um, and it's an interesting connection, of course, to the future of the building. In the early 1930s, an attempt is made to set up an Irish-speaking secondary school, Kloch de Wirre. While they're looking for a larger site to accommodate their great needs, they actually spend the first year of their existence here at 6 Harcourt Street. And amongst the students who sit in Harcourt Street in the first year of Kloch de Wirre's operation is Seamus Ennis, the great musician, and Ilan Piper. In 1937, a new constitution is enacted in Ireland. Several reforms are made to the Seanad, the Senate, and the first Seanad elected under the 1937 constitution is organised through Six Harcourt Street. The votes are actually counted in this building. So Six Harcourt Street is not only a house with a connection to the end of the Irish Parliament, which existed before the Act of Union in 1801. It is the mother of of Doyle Aaron, and it is also, in a way, where the first Shannad under the 1937 constitution was created, or where its composition became clear. Six Harcourt Street continues as a state building in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, the Office of Posts and Telegraphs is its main user in the 1950s, for example. In 1965, the decision is made by the Irish government to sell it to Conor Nguelge, at a low fee, and we move into the house in 1966. From 1966 onwards, it is the centre of a lot of campaigns for the Irish language. The setting up of Gwelskulner connected to the building, Coltus Kjolter, Yerenhav offices here for a while. 
attempts are made to establish a movement for Irish elementary schools, the Nienra movement. Again, very important meetings in the House. Human rights campaigns, campaigns to help the Gwaeltacht and to help Gwaeltacht civil rights are helped out from here. A great campaign for an Irish language television service, Television na Gaelga, as it was originally called, TG Cahar, as it's called today. A lot of work takes place in Six Harcourt Street to make that happen. The conversations that have taken place within these walls have had great consequences for the development of Ireland and they continue to do so today. I feel very privileged to work in this house. I feel very privileged to work in these rooms and I can't wait to return to it full time and for life to return to this great house again. It was my privilege to lead you around Ivor Shays, Roy Jark or Six Harcourt Street today and I hope you enjoyed the tour. Bailoi yw'r ef gwneir, ta anna as ym fewn siw, eich pobl na gweithtachta. I'm delighted to be here at pobl na gweithtachta, virtually, at the Milwaukee Irish Fest. I was here last year in person. And um, I'm going to sing a song called Ogaanig an Chul Chrewig. Um, it's an unusual song in the sense that it seems to have come from an English ballad called The Unquiet Grave. It's a conversation between the distraught man and his lover who is in the grave. And uh, I was very drawn to it when I heard it first, being sung by Eilish Nihulavan from Cooley. And the words are from um, Martin Freeman, who collected it in 1914 in the Moose Creek So here it goes at Oganig on Hul Chrevig. Ah, oh, God, who will crave God in Tever Gumintu? Oh, William to Gamchele, no one to tell all into. Oh, 